One of my favorite things about going after wild ideas is they often have a ripple effect. When we achieve something big like finishing a race or surfing our first wave, it's like getting a deposit of courage into our bank account. Afterwards, we realize that we can do so much more than we ever thought. Cal Dobbs is a young endurance athlete who's made a lot of courage deposits. Cal started living a wild life when he asked himself this question. You know, you look at what you have or what's available to you and you say, but wasn't it supposed to be bigger and more wonderful than this? And if you answer yes, then you better go get it. In 2022, Cal became the first known transgender person to Triple Crown, which means he hiked all of the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, and Continental Divide Trail. These are three of the longest and best known trails in the U.S. Combined, they're almost 8,000 miles long. Now Cal is going after his next wild idea. Instead of hiking, he'll be running across the country for trans rights. Cal goes by both he, him, and they, them pronouns. Since Cal's preference is he, him, that's what we'll be using in this episode. I'm Shelby Stanger, and this is Wild Ideas Worth Living, an REI Co-op Studios production. Cal Dobbs grew up in Venice Beach, California, and ran competitively in high school. He went on to become a collegiate cross-country runner. Cal learned a lot about himself during college. He found out that the further he ran, the more he liked it, and he started entering ultra races. College is also where he fell in love with through hiking. Cal, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. So let's just start with this. You're this L.A. kid from Venice Beach, Mm -hmm. and you triple crown. So for people who don't know, Mm -hmm. triple crowning means you hiked the entire Pacific Crest Trail, the entire Appalachian Trail, and the entire Continental Trail. Just doing one of those trails is like a major, major feat. So I'm guessing Mm -hmm. college, like did you have like an outdoor club? Yes, my journey to the outdoors, I like to think of it as me finding my way back to myself. I didn't grow up backpacking. I grew up running around the concrete blocks in LA. And then I did go to college in uh, Pennsylvania in a suburb of Philadelphia. I was on the cross country and track teams. Um, And what I discovered with myself in running is that the longer the distance got, the better I did. So I was like, okay, uh, I'm an endurance athlete. I'm, you know, I'm running the 5K. My coach wants to put me in the 10K. That's cool. And uh, then I learned about ultra marathons, and I was like, that's it. I'm gonna do that. How old were you when you did your first ultra marathon? 20. That's impressive. Yeah, and I loved it. But I always wanted to push that limit. That is something, just like you said, that when you have that quality, when you have that grit, where you just you want to find what that line is. As an athlete, you caught the bug. That's for life. It's never going to go away. So I was getting ready to graduate. And my last spring break, a couple months before graduation, my dear friend took me on my first backpacking trip ever in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And I absolutely fell in love. I'd never seen anything like the White Mountains. And we got to the top and he goes, right there, that's the AT. And I was like, AT, what are you talking about? What? What's that? And uh, he's like, the Appalachian Trail. I'm like, what's that? And he explained it to me. And I was like, that, that is what I'm doing when I graduate. So two days after graduation, I was at Springer Mountain heading northbound on the Appalachian Trail. Full disclosure, I do not recommend a through hike with zero backpacking experience. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It feels akin to the kid who's like, oh, I got a B and I didn't even study. It's like, well, you know, you don't get points for not studying. So I don't take pride in not being prepared for things, but I also value that experience. And I think uh, basically my AT through hike, pardon my French, was such a shit show that when I got to Katahdin and it's a miracle I made it all the way to the end, I still felt like there was a lot left for me out there on those trails. I felt like, you know, I made the friends of a lifetime that I'm still friends with. I have all these crazy, ridiculous stories you get on a through hike. I mean, the AT is bonkers. It's w- What's your trail name? My trail name is Starburst. 
And that is not after the candy. Uh, that is how I cry a lot on trail. And I usually smile when I'm doing it. <laughs> they were like, Starburst. Um, which speaks oh. to how emotional and moving and spiritual of a, an experience a through hike inherently is if you let it. Uh, so I finished that hike. And of course, you know, it was filled with pride and um, just so changed by that journey. But I just got this sense that I wasn't done that there was more that nature had to teach me, more growth to be had. But I was flat broke and I didn't have any money. So I was like, well, <laughs> let's go get a job for a while. You know, the classic through hiker cycle of you work, you hike, you work, you hike. And so uh, I moved back to LA and I got a teaching job, which I loved. And then a couple years later, the pandemic hit. And I was really faced with a decision that I think a lot of people can resonate with, which is that the pandemic changed everything. And if there was one thing that it taught us, it's that life is very fragile and our time here is finite. So if you have the guts, you have a decision to make. And I asked myself, if I died tomorrow, would I feel I had lived a full life? And the answer was no. So I said, all right, well, what is it that you need to do? to answer yes to that question. And I said, I need to triple crown and I need to run across America. Between completing the Appalachian Trail and starting the Continental Divide Trail, Cal spent three years teaching in LA. He set out from the Continental Divide Trailhead in 2021 and arrived at the terminus in Mexico five months later. Then in summer of 2022, Cal went after the final jewel of his triple crown, the Pacific Crest Trail. Even though he was really looking forward to this trip, nature threw him some curveballs. Every through hiker I've talked to has a very unique story about either when shit goes wrong or how the trail changed them. And yes. I'm curious if you have a story that you repeatedly tell your buddies at the bar or wherever, coffee <laughs> yeah. shop. Oh, I have a story for you. In retrospect, very unwise. We almost died out there, but my <laughs> my big, uh, <laughs> I do not recommend it. Um, but at the same time, I'm glad it happened. So on my PCT through hike, you know, I'd already done the Continental Divide, which is sort of the, you know, daddy long legs of the trails. People are like, oh, it's the hardest one. I'd already done the CDT. So I'm flying pretty high. I'm like, PCT, no problem. But because the PCT is so popular these days and because, unfortunately, you know, climate change exacerbating the wildfires we get here in California, I knew that I had to finish the trail. So I said, I'm going to start as early as possible. I got my permit for early March, which is a very early start date. Most people start a month or more after that. But I wanted to get ahead of the fires. So we start in early March, uh, me and my partner and my dog. And we make it to Kennedy Meadows South, which is the foothills base of the Sierra Mountains. We get there very early. So if anyone's familiar with the Sierras, they know they got a lot of snow up there. <laughs> and you're supposed to start later to wait for it to, to melt. But we plowed right through there. And me and my hiking partner were actually the first through hikers through the Sierras last year. And we had the good fortune of it not being uh, too high of a snow year, but it was still very snowy. And it was uh, just very dramatic being out there. I mean, those are some of the most popular mountains in the country and nobody experiences them the way that we did. We went through Yosemite. We were the only people in the entire national park. I what? mean, how, how many people went, can say that? How is that? <laughs> Because the park was closed. There's no, I mean, it's open for the PCT hikers, but there's no visitors. All the roads are closed. There's no rangers out there because there's nobody there. And the snow, it's just too much snow. Nobody wants to be out there. And for good reason, let me tell you, because we headed into Mammoth, which is right before Yosemite. First hikers there. And we started heading out of Mammoth and we ran into the folks behind us. And they were like, hey, you know, there's a big storm coming. 30% chance of snow tomorrow. And we're like, oh, 30 that's nothing. So we head into Yosemite. Oh, no. What we didn't know was it was 30% chance tomorrow, 100% chance the five days after that. <laughs> so everybody else got the memo. They stayed in town to wait it out. 
Somehow we missed the memo. You know, we figured we'd be fine. So we we head no. in, into Yosemite National Park and uh, it starts snowing. And we're like, well, you know, it'll stop. And needless to say, it did not stop. It snowed for the next five days. We did not have enough food to, to have our mileage slowed down that much. The trail was fully covered. So we had no idea where we were going. It was very dangerous. Uh, there was one particular slope on a mountain where and of course we had ice axes and micro spikes and it was this very steep drop off directly into a raging river and that is probably the closest I've ever been to death because one misstep and you will die (laughs) um I hope I never say that again I'm not a daredevil I'm very I'm actually a very risk averse person I actually really love my life but that was also the most beautiful place I have ever been I mean it was quiet it was so quiet I've never felt peace in the outdoors like that what was something you really learned about yourself through hiking that you didn't learn Mm. anywhere else Mm. oh that's a great question let me ask you this too. Um, mm. This might be a different question, but um, mm. was there one trail that changed you the most out of all three? Mm. Mm. You know, okay, I have my answer and I'm going to combine those two questions. Specifically, it really clicked into place for me on the Continental Divide Trail, the CDT, because it is the most rugged. It's the most remote of the trails, you know, the longest distance between towns, no cell service whatsoever. I think, you know, as beautiful as I just said, Yosemite is and the PCT is, the CDT was the most consistently breathtaking trail of any of them. You go through Glacier National Park, the Wind River Range in Wyoming, uh, the Rocky Mountains go through Colorado, and then the desert, you finish in the desert in New Mexico. So because it's so remote and because there's these long stretches where you don't really see another soul, it's also the least popular of those three through hikes. So there's not as many hikers out there. That is the trail where I really learned to love being alone and I fell in love with my own company and I began to fall in love with myself. I'm a very extroverted person, a very social person, but what I realized, you know, especially growing up, being the star athlete, you're getting a lot of attention and we start to feed off it. And I'm sure there's lots of athletes out there listening to this who really resonate with that. And uh, it kind of becomes like a fix or like a drug. And then I, you know, pretty much lived my whole life up to that point for the approval of other people, for the accolades of all these, you know, achievements. And then I started through hiking and there's really nobody there. There's no one clapping when you cross the finish line. There's nobody there saying, good job, Cal. There's nobody even there being like, how's your day? Nobody, no one's there. It's you and nature. And that was terrifying for me when I first started hiking. It brought me to my needs, if I'm being honest, and I almost quit. And then, you know, I realized there's a reason why everybody likes me, (laughs) you know, not to sound conceited, but I'm like, well, everybody else seems to like me. Why don't I like me? Everyone loves Cal, except for Cal. This is a lifelong process for me and for everyone is self-love and self-care. It's a daily practice. But the CDT is really where, like I said, those voices started to settle. I really came into my transness. So I was, you know, really stepping into myself, really stepping into my identity and really starting to decide who I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. To honor the lessons he learned on the trail, Cal is finally pursuing something he's wanted to do for a long time. Run across America. In March 2023, just one day after this interview, Cal started his run. He sent us an update about how it's going from the road. You'll hear that and more after the break. In 2022, Cal Dobbs became the first known trans person to complete the Triple Crown. After completing one life-changing wild idea, he dove right into another, 
running across the country. Cal has wanted to do this since he was just 10 years old. Now, 16 years later, he is finally making his dream a reality. But the social landscape of our country has changed a lot since he was a kid. Today, the U.S. feels more politically divided than ever before, especially when it comes to trans rights. For Cal, who is transmasculine, these issues are very personal. I want to talk about this run across the country because your why for doing Mm -hmm. the Triple Crown was one reason, and now you have this why to run across America. Mm -hmm. How long is this going to take you? So it's going to be between 2,400 miles and about 2,800 miles, depending on my route, the route. which uh, should take me about four to five months, depending on how slow or fast I decide to do it. So tell us just a little bit about where you're starting and where you are planning to ending subject to change. Yes. So I am choosing an unconventional route. To my knowledge, no one of the like hundred or less people who have ever run across America, none. I don't think any of them have taken this route, which I think is pretty cool. So I'm starting right here in my hometown in Los Angeles. Heck and I'm yeah. running south through California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and ending in Florida. And of course, that was on purpose. Those are the battleground states for a lot of this anti-trans dialogue and rhetoric. These are the places where transgender people need love more than anywhere else in the country right now. That was intentional. I also just love the Southwest. I was born and raised here. My family lives in the South. I love the South. I love Texas. I've got a lot of friends from Texas. I spent a good amount of time in Texas. Unfortunately, at the legislative level, they don't love trans people too much. But I think on the interpersonal level... Texas is full of a bunch of loving individuals and um, I'll be running with my support crew, which is my friend and my two dogs. (laughs) Um, My friend is also a through hiker and trans. And then I've got a film crew that'll be flying out a couple of times along the way. So yeah, I intend to stop along the way at some major towns in like Phoenix, Albuquerque, Austin, Houston, New Orleans ending in Tallahassee. And in each of those places, I'm really hoping to do what we've been talking about, which is building connections, building community. I am not here to change anyone's mind. I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to do any of that. I'm really here to learn and offer what I have to give to the people who want it. You know, there's a phrase that I love, which is uh, go where the love is. And that's really what this run is about. It's about spreading joy. You're going to host community meetups at some of these stops, many of these stops. What does that Mm -hmm. look like? It's about finding the groups that are already doing this important work of advocating for trans people. And I want to come and uplift that work by, you know, building connections and also doing fundraisers. I also think it's really important for trans people, especially youth. You know, I'm a teacher and I know the gravity that it has for a trans kid to see a transgender adult who is thriving, who is happy, who has all of the things that they want to embody because that's the narrative is, you know, oh, if you transition, no one will love you. You'll be ugly. You'll be gross. Like, this is wrong. This is bad. You know, you can't have access to gender-affirming health care. You're not, you're, you know, you say you're a girl, but you have still have to compete with the boys, which is so dysphoric and humiliating. And it's rough. I mean, it's rough being a teenager just in general. Can you imagine being a trans teenager? So, you know, I want to be a beacon. And the data says that it just takes one person sometimes in the life of transgender youth to totally change it around. The suicide rate for trans youth goes down 
I think something like 80% when a trans kid has one adult in their life that respects their pronouns. So we know that a lot of the mental health issues that queer and trans kids face, a lot of the high suicide rates, that has to do with the culture that they're living in. It's not because they're trans, it's because of the reaction that they're getting and the response they're getting to being trans. So if I can host a community event where I can talk to the kids, ask them about about their dreams, and then I'm a trans person living my dreams, that's partly why I took a sabbatical from teaching because, you know, I realized I was showing up to class every day, encouraging my students to pursue their dreams. And then I'd be a hypocrite if I wasn't living that. When I told my kids that I was going to take a break from teaching and I wouldn't be there next year, and I told them why, and I'm very transparent with my students. I can't tell you how many parents came to me and said, you know, my kid is going to remember you as a teacher forever. And it's not because what they learned in the classroom, it's because what you're going to do outside of the classroom, how you are modeling living your dreams. Aside from being a great role model for his students, Cal is a truly skilled teacher. He's warm and open and doesn't shy away from hard topics. Lately, there's been a lot of conversation about trans people in sports, particularly trans women. I had some questions about these issues, and Cal handled my curiosity with clarity and openness. Let's not beat around the bush. All of this anti-trans legislation is targeted primarily at trans women, especially in sports specifically. So why is it all targeting trans women? And it speaks to this larger conversation that we need to have as a society that we're all implicated in, which is patriarchy and sexism, right? The reason that we fear or that society fears trans women more than trans men is because people don't understand transgender identity. So when an ignorant person looks at a trans woman, they see a man and men are threatening. You look at a trans man, you're like, oh, that's just a confused woman and women aren't threatening, right? And it's not anyone's fault it's all subconscious is because a lot of the rhetoric treats trans women like men you know the bathroom bills are all about sexual assault and oh I don't want a man in the woman's bathroom statistics show us that zero percent truly zero percent of reported sexual assault cases this year were perpetrated by trans women and the majority of those are perpetrated by cis men It's all fear-based, fear of the unknown, which is why, you know, we see this legislation being posed by people who have clearly never even met a trans person. And I'm a very firm believer that if you just have a human connection, and we see that. I have a personal example. Uh, Literally yesterday, I had to call my bank (laughs) for uh, some difficulties I've been having with my account. I think we all kind of armor up before we call the bank, you know, like, (laughs) all right, it's war. It's it's battle time. Like, I'm going to get what I want and it's going to be hard. And like, you will resolve this. I'm not going to talk to 10 different people. (laughs) And I called uh, and I was ready to be pretty adversarial. And this person answered the phone and they're so warm and they're so kind and they're so helpful. And they're like, you know, unfortunately, there's only so much I can do. I've got to transfer you to my supervisor. So if you don't mind, I'll place you on a brief hold. And then I said, yeah, sure. So they placed me on a hold. And then uh, they're like, I'm so sorry. It's just going to be a little while longer. We're on hold again. And then uh, because, you know, She was also waiting for this supervisor to answer the phone. She comes back on the line and she's like, you know, I couldn't get in touch with them yet. I'm still on hold, but I I think I'd like to be on hold with you if that's okay. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And she goes, cause I'm, I'm just so curious, you know, like you were mentioning what you do for work. You were mentioning you're a professional endurance athlete. And I'm just so curious, like, what does that mean? What do you do? And I'm like, you know, I told her about my through hikes and I told her I was about to run across America and, uh, she was blown away. And she was like, I just, I have so many questions for you. And, uh, you know, she was telling me about her daughter and just, we had a blast. We didn't even realize we were on hold. We were just chatting. And finally, you know, the boss answered the phone and we wrapped up. And at the end of the call, um, 
she said, you know, I, I, I'm probably not supposed to do this, but is there a place I could follow along, you know, your journeys? Oh. And I said, of course. And I gave her my website and my Instagram handle. And uh, she said, you know, I just want to let you know you are, you are such a beautiful person. You're such a light in this world. You've made my day. I'm so excited for all your adventures. And I was like, oh, thank you. And, uh, you know, we hung up the phone and I immediately got a little sad because I thought, how would this person's opinion of me change if they knew that I was trans? Because I didn't talk about that on the phone. I didn't come out to this person. And disclosure is a big thing for trans people. But, you know, and also like I need her help resolving this issue with my bank. So I was like, oh no, is she going to look up my website and my Instagram? And is she going to be like, oh my God. She told me she lives in Texas too. And you know, I don't like to judge. She's like, I live in rural Texas. And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, that's the epicenter for all this rhetoric and dialogue right now. And I'm worried maybe she wouldn't have felt that way if she had known. And, um, I went about my day and I got on my phone a couple minutes later and checked Instagram and I had a message request and it said, hey, this is me from the lady from the bank. I just wanted to say I'm so glad I found your page. I think what you're doing is so cool. I live in Texas and if, you know, I, I saw that your run is heading through Texas and, uh, you know, don't don't tell my boss I'm reaching out to you. But uh, if you're if you're ever running through here, you know, I'd love to come say hi or maybe, you know, bring you something. And I looked up where she lives, and I am running through her town. Oh, that story gave me goosebumps. As of June 2023, Cal is partway through his run across the country. Here's a note from him about how it's been going. Hey, what's up? It's Cal. I'm recording this from a gas station in San Antonio, Texas, which is about 1,500 miles into my 2,500-mile transcontinental run. I've been having so much fun meeting trans people and allies across America and hosting community events and fundraisers to bring love and resources to the trans people most impacted by this unprecedented onslaught of anti-trans legislation. Cal Dobbs, thank you so much for coming on Wild Ideas Worth Living. We're rooting for you over the next few months as you finish your run across the country. At the end of Cal's run, he's hosting a 5K in Tallahassee, Florida, called the Trot for Trans Lives. You can participate virtually or in person. To learn more about this race and Cal's journey across the country, check out Cal's Instagram at Cal underscore hikes. That's C-A-L underscore H-I-K-E-S. Wild Ideas Worth Living is part of the REI Podcast Network. It's hosted by me, Shelby Stanger, produced by Annie Fassler, Sylvia Thomas, and Sam Piers Nitzberg of Puddle Creative, and our senior producer is Jenny Barber. Our executive producers are Paolo Motola and Joe Crosby. As always, we love it when you follow the show, rate it, and write a review wherever you listen. And remember, some of the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas.